Hi there and welcome back. Now, in the first video of this series, I took a string quartet, a relatively straightforward piece that I'd recorded directly into my door and exported the MIDI and imported that MIDI directly into my notation software. With a few simple rules, I didn't take, it didn't take a great deal of preparation to create some parts. With a little bit more tidying up, the parts would have been ready to present to any players. Then in the second video, I took a much more complicated piece using all the instruments or virtually all the instruments of the orchestra and unsurprisingly ended up with quite a mess once it was opened up in the notation software. If you haven't seen either of these videos, then maybe you should watch them first. As in this video, I'm going to show you how I go about preparing parts from a MIDI file and offer a few tips on how to make it so much easier than it looked in the last video. Someone messaged me after seeing that first um, video and said to me, well, why would I need to work outside of Cubase on a project like this anyway? Well, if any of us is lucky enough to have our music or the music we have created in our door played by real musicians, as good as Cubase is, the scoring part of the door or any similar door certainly can't produce anything like the quality of parts required to hand over to a professional or amateur orchestra or any group of players. I'm doing this so I can show viewers exactly what I'm writing in a music notation form rather than just looking at a screen full of MIDI data. Now, as um, some of you will know already, and I've mentioned it on a few occasions, my notation software is Dorico. I am a convert to Dorico from Sibelius, which I'd used for 15, 16 years. And I'm going to show you something in Dorico that makes life so, so much easier when doing this type of work. Whether it's in Finale or whether it's in Sibelius, I'm a little bit unsure. So then, let's make a start and we're going to work very differently this time. But before we do anything, we need to prepare the file. Now, let me give you some facts to start with. This piece that I'm working on is just over 200 um, bars or measures in length. There are 43 tracks in total. And um, as most of you will know that I've done this type of work. You can spend not only hours, days, months, even longer sometimes going to and fro in and refining and making certain changes. We're going to make some substantial changes to this file before we decide to um, uh, um, export it to a MIDI file to then import into notation software. So the last thing we want to do is to screw up any work that we may have done previously. So tip number one, without a doubt, I'm go, let's go to do a save as so let's produce um save as or a new version i'm going to stick this on my desktop we'll call it three graces for export that'll do right so now we we can do what we want with this we can always go back to the original version if need be now, um, one of the first things we need to consider really is the size of the um, um, orchestra and the number of players that we're going to be converting um, these files for. Um, um, it might be a case of you reducing it down just to 16 players or what I'm going to try to do in, in this instance, I'm going to try and convert it for as though it was going to be, I don't know, a 32 or 64 piece orchestra so you might want to give some consideration to that and the reason i'm saying that is in this particular piece we've got a choir well i'm not expecting a choir to be relevant so um or available should i say so first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to take um that choir select all the events in the choir and hit the delete button straight off. Uh, secondly, I know that at the end of this particular piece, uh, because it's a theatre work, it actually goes into um, a little bit with a honky-tonk piano, don't ask why, um, and I definitely don't need that, so let's just remove uh, those tracks as well. Um, so we'll be reducing tracks all the time. Um, that's the first thing. Now, um, this might sound really obvious, but we need to now 
start thinking about um, not only the size of the orchestra, but the instruments that's going to be in the orchestra. Um, and I've actually drawn up on just off a piece of paper um, a list of the instruments that I definitely need. So I'm definitely going to need two flutes and an oboe, a couple of clarinets, a bassoon and a bass clarinet. Um, I'm going to need at least three horns. I might go for four, a couple of trumpets, a tenor trombone and a bass trombone. Um, I, there's harp in here and there's piano in here. Um, obviously, when it comes to strings, I'm going to have the full string section. So violins one, two, viola, cello, and uh, contrabass or double bass. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about percussion. Um, what's very easy to do when we're working outdoors is just to keep adding tracks and all oh, that patch sounds like quite good. All oh, that sample, I want to use that sample, whatever. And for all we know, we we've, may have hundreds of, of tracks that we need now now need to. Uh, reduce down but when it comes to percussion, percussion I always find it's best to whatever you've written for percussion export it anyway um, because we don't know if we're going to have one player two players three players in in that particular section um, and we can make decisions on whether that player that's doing the cymbal is going to do the bass drum or whatever later down the line so I tend to export all percussion um, come what may um, if using a template, and you can see from here that I've, I've used this particular template. So in this, this woodwind um, template here, um, that's colored in blue, um, you'll see that there are some um, tracks that have not been used. They're not highlighted. Um, as I mentioned before in my video about templates, um, I tend to put all the instruments I'm ever likely to use from a particular library. Um, into my template, um, but I then deactivate them um, so that when I load a template, my template can can load in seconds rather than hours sometimes if you were to load all the samples, which you're never going to need anyway. So those that are highlighted are where there is some data somewhere in this, in this particular piece, but you don't need to delete those because when you export to MIDI, the file that it creates will only create tracks for where there is MIDI data to start with. So we don't need to worry about making any deletions like that. Now, one key to what I'm about to do, and it's really important, is adding a marker track. Now, I think most doors have a marker track anyway. Um, I've got uh, mine set up um, uh, here. And across the top here, we'll see that I've just in the process of putting this piece of work together. Um, I do actually have some markers. There's one there called intro flute solo, which turned out to be a nobo solo. But anyway, um, that string swells um, D minor horns. What else have I put uh, B flat major section? And I think later down the line, I've got an ostinato section. Uh, a trumpet, that's a trumpet solo section, that's where the strings enter, that's where the choir enters, etc, etc. Marker tracks. It's useful for just finding your way around what can be quite a complicated uh, string, uh, screen full of, of data. Now, with marker tracks, these markers, um, I highly recommend that you include as part of the uh, MIDI file that you're going to export. And they will show, certainly in Dorica, whether they show it in, in Sibelius, yes, they do. And I, I can remember that they do show it in, in Sibelius. The more of these markers you can add, the better. So I'm just going to add a few now. So um, it, it, you could add a marker where the, uh, there's a time signature change, for instance. So uh, in there, let me put Let's just call marker number marker number ten in this instance. So marker number ten is the goes back to four four time. Um, I'm trying to think. I can't. It's such a long time since I um, recorded this. I can't quite think where certain entries are. Okay, we'll, we'll go with the markers that are there at the moment anyway. Um, so I've got, how many have I got? I've got 10 in total. Those are go gonna become very key a um, little bit later down the line. Now, when you export as a, as a mix down, 
um, you tend to set um, these little markers at the top to say this is the section of music that I'm going for a mix down. You don't need to set those because when you're exporting MIDI, it's just going to export what's there, regardless of where you put these markers. So that's a particular waste of time as well. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about quantizing. Um, in the first two videos, I did a fair bit of uh, quantizing and I use what's called a legato function. Certainly in um, the, the first video where I just did a string quartet. Um, and one of the keys, of course, with um, strings um, is to make sure that strings overlap. Um, but when it comes to um, actually putting that data into notation, then you're not going to want them to overlap quite so much. The big problem with quantization, though, is that it's kind of limited in as far as you need to determine what's your highest denominator of note. Now, I know that in this particular piece, the highest denomination is a semiquaver or a 16th note. And if I was to um, if I was to quantize this entire piece to 16 notes, um, there's going to be some inaccuracies, certainly when it comes to things like strings and just mo just moving very slightly, if that, that makes sense. But what I will do anyway, um, I'll take the string long section. So I'll take that, that one, there's a string long. Um, there's some more string longs, there's a solo cello. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Longs, longs, longs. We'll not worry about the spiccato at this point. So we'll take those and we'll go to uh, quantization. And in this instance, we're going to have to go for 16th notes and we'll, we'll try and quantize that best we can. The rule used to be quantize the hell out of your piece before you import it into notation. Um, I'm not convinced that's that's always quite as necessary for what will become very obvious uh, in, in a short space of time. Now, one other note before we start to export, I want you to think about triplets. Because um, converting MIDI into notation software um, Notation software doesn't tend to like triplets. And if if some of your timing has been a little bit out, um, it can assume that it's a triplet. And then when you see it on the screen, there's a lot of sorting out to try and get it to play exactly how it should play. And actually, it's not a triplet at all. But we'll look at that when we start to import into notation as well. So I know that in this particular piece, there are no triplets. So uh, we've got uh, as many markers as we can. Um, we're ignoring this uh, this top part here because it's just going to export anyway. Um, and we're now going to go for it. Let's just go for it and uh, let's export to uh, MIDI. Uh, we'll call it Untitled MIDI and I'll put it on my desktop for now. Oh, there we go. Now. Certainly in Cubase, and it will be the same in other doors, um, there'll be some export options. The vast majority of these, it won't do anything in, in notation software, so let's ignore it. But one key is to make sure that that one there, export markers, is ticked. Um, because that's going to guide you through what's going to be a, a whole host of uh, notes in front of you on the screen. So let's the OK and we're off. So we've finished with Cubase so let's just minimize Cubase for the time being and we're going to go into uh, Dorico in this particular case. Now let's forget about opening up any new files at this point and deciding on our, um, our orchestra. What we're going to do we're going to open directly what we've just exported um, and that is our file called Untitled MIDI hit the open button. And this is where we now need to go through and have a think about some of the import options. Now, the vast majority of import options are the same throughout um, Finale or Sibelius, or so I'm led to believe from what I can remember. Um, 
But what we do need to do at this point is we need to look here at these quantize options. And in this second box here, we have um, um, a tick box for detecting uh, tuplets, um, which I, because I know this particular piece, there are no triplets in it whatsoever. I'm deactivating that. So it's not going to cause that particular confusion. But here is another tick box, um, a little known, little used, I suspect, tick box, but it has enormous power. Um, and that is called fill gaps. Now, we will have seen in the second video when uh, the notation software was trying to um, trying to replicate all articulations, all the short notes, no matter how short the sample was, before the next sample, it just filled it with numerous rests. Um, and some of these samples were de was detected at a demi semi semi quaver uh, or demi semi demi semi quaver or 64th note um, and so it looked an absolute mess full of um, uh, arrests this little tick box here actually fills those gaps until the next sample and makes everything look a great deal more tidy so that is the magic tick box as far as I'm concerned certainly in Dorico so we'll okay to that um, and we'll okay to everything else fingers crossed what we're going to get. Well, here we go. Now, compared to the previous video that we looked at, when we look here, oh, we've actually got some notes that are actually readable. And where have all those rests gone? Well, that's down to the fact that we've just ticked that um, fill rests box. So the, the part is now starting to look a little bit more like what we would expect it to do. Now, the next thing we need to look at is we need to, because we, we, we're not going to be converting this in any way, or we're not going to be tidying up this file. We're going to be copying and pasting into a new file. And we need to spend a little bit of time on this file now, um, basically tidying it up, making it readable. First thing um, I would always uh, go for um, would be um, make sure that we are on the maximum paper size. Uh, whether you're going to print it out or not is irrelevant. So we're A3 um, and I'm actually uh, making the notes quite small just really to create vertical space on the page more than anything else. That's a little bit more more readable now. Now here we've got those um, 43 tracks less the ones that I, I, uh, I, I deleted but we're getting to a point where it's looking kind of reasonable. Um, the I, again, it's one of these techniques in when we're working indoors. We never start at bar one. Uh, we'll start about five or six or something like that. So you can see here, I've got, uh, what, eight bars before anything starts. So we're going to I just select those eight bars and delete those so that it actually starts at bar number one. Now, that is quite key. We'll see a little bit later on. And we'll notice... If I put this into galley view, which I find a little bit easy to read and zoom in a little bit, we'll notice now at the top here, we have our markers, intro, flute, solo, string swells, 4-4 four, four time, that's the one that I put in, is one uh, D minor horns. Um, it, it's actually giving us as well if I if I just find an oh, there's another one just go back to the previous one any uh, tempo marks uh, or metronome marks you can see um, has been imported um, it'll also give you um, a time um, if you need that but we don't in this particular case so it's really marked out the various sections that we've got. Now, that is a lot of information, but if we just have a look around it, all those nasty rests have just disappeared. But, of course, we do have a lot of empty bars. Um, and all these empty bars are all the tracks that I perhaps use for one sample or one bar or whatever, and that's what we're going to have to uh, get rid of eventually. 
Okay, what we'll do at this point, let's just save that and we'll call it, um, I don't know, data original. Let's stick that on the desktop like that. Okay. Um, let me just make this a little bit bigger. Boop, boop, boop. Okay. Um, now we're going to think about creating our new file that we're going to paste into. Um, and one of the great things of modern software, I find templates, not only in doors, but in notation software as well. Um, and we've got um, here to choose from, I've got classical orchestra, concert orchestra, film orchestra, modern orchestra, romantic orchestra, string orchestra, certainly not the string orchestra. I think the nearest one we'll get to is concert orchestra. So let's just open up a concert orchestra uh, template and see what we've got. And if I zoom in a little bit here, right, we might have too many instruments. I know I'm going to use two flutes. I've already decided that I'm going to use one oboe. So let's uh, just delete that oboe. Plant its part. Clarinets one and two, yes. Bassoons, um, I want only one bassoon. So let's just delete that. Um, I've all, actually, I've got a bass clarinet, so I definitely need to put a bass clarinet in. There she is, in B flat. To B flat. Let's put it in the right position under the B flat clarinets. Uh, then we've got horns, one, two, three, and four. Yeah, let's leave it at that. Trumpets one and two, yes. Trumpets three. Uh, no, I'm going to take it out for the time being. Let's just delete that. Uh, trombone, one, two. Yes, bass trombone. Uh, yes, uh, tuba. No, there's no tuba. Delete player. Parts, timpani, yes. Um, it's given us some uh, percussion. Uh, side drum, bass drum, crash cymbal. Let's leave those for the time being. Bass guitar, definitely not in this. So let's just delete him or her. We have a harp part, yes. Piano part, yes. Violins, one, two, viola, cello, double bass. Right, okay. So those, going back to my little list from earlier, um, those are the players that I'm going to use. I might add to them. I might delete them when we get to it. Who knows? Okay, so now we have two files. Um, what I also do uh, at this point um, in the uh, new file is I will add a time signature. Um, it starts in 4-4. Four, four. So let's stick 4-4 four, four in there. Let's also at this point add some bars because I know that roughly it's around about 200 bars. So let's just stick 210 in to be on the safe side. Okay. Uh, okay. One um, failing in um, exporting MIDI into notation software, it, I find, is that it doesn't recognize key signatures. Perhaps some of these geniuses that um, created MIDI might consider that next time. Um, I know, however, that in this particular piece to start with, um, it started in the G major. I just happen to know that. So let's take a key signature in there. Um, right, now, when it comes to cutting and pasting, um, I've kind of got a theory on this. Um, and what I'm going to try and show you now is that, um, let me just go to full screen again, there I am. Now, I have a um, two screen set up here. Let me show you, come on, let me show you turn this round and you'll see that I've got and you'll see that I've got uh, my main screen that I'm working on here um, and then up here I've got a, another screen okay uh, with my notes yeah okay right that's enough of that 
Let's go back. Now, the reason I showed you that is because previously what I've done is I've had the original on one monitor and then my new file on another and I've moved them across and I've suddenly realized that there is a much, much better way. You can do it all on one screen. Let me show you. Okay, now, what I'd like to do, um, oh, and another, another tip as well. When we're working on our doors or notation software, it's always this dimension, the vertical dimension on a screen that you seem to be short of space because when it comes to moving horizontally, you tend to scroll horizontally. Um, and I always like to have, um, my docking, uh, my dock, as they're called in a Mac, on the left hand side. So it just creates a little bit more space down here at the bottom. Now, um, so we have um, our new file here um, and I'm going to reduce that down to round about there and we'll stick that at the bottom of the screen. Let's move it outwards a little bit. Okay. Um, and then this here is the imported file and we'll do exactly the same again. Well, let's zoom in a little bit. So both are roughly the same, bottom one out a little bit. Boop, boop. In fact, that bottom one, let's have that in gallery view as well. Right, okay. What I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to align both files. so that we have bar number one over bar number one, etc., etc. Now, I find it's also useful at this, time, this point, before we start copy and pasting anything, to um, put all the, um, uh, the time signatures in. So we start at bar five there, so there we go, bar five, it goes into three, four, put that into three, four. Um, let's just scroll across and I think the next point, the four, four at bar 41. Find bar 41. There it is. And we go back into four, four there. And I think actually it stays in four, four. You see, there's just such a lot of empty bars. In four, four. Um, um, so that's the first thing that I do. Then secondly, I would at this point now start to um, bring these markers into play. Um, so that what I call intro, just copy paste at R9, the new file. Boom. It's what I've called a flute solo there at uh, bar 13. Copy that. Bar 13. Paste that. What I'm actually trying to do is I'm trying to put the structure together in the new file. So not only have we got the markers, uh, we've got the, um, uh, the time signatures, um, we can put um, key signatures in, we can put metronome marks in. Just build that template before you start copy and pasting the actual notes. It will just give you a much clearer uh, point of reference and you'll be able to find your way around the, the files much easier. Okay, now this is where the hard work starts really. I'm going to go down to, um, I'm going to go down to the strings. Um, Go down to the strings to start with, and uh, bar seven, this particular chord starts. And then all, what I would tend to do is I tend to work in sections horizontally. So it, I might take a four or an eight bar section, or if I've got enough markers, that full marker. And I would bring them then down to the bottom one. So I would copy that. Um, these are string long notes. Well, well, it's long or short, it's still going to be the same player, isn't it? So I'll paste that into there. Um, we've got a sustained note 
um, there, which is very likely to be violas and cellos. Okay, and paste that into the double bass as well. Um, but we're going to have that uh, an octave lower. Uh, we don't need the bottom note. Uh, yes, okay, yes, okay, we know what it sounds like. Okay, stop. Um, and then if we come and paste that, we can put that down into the, you see what I'm doing? Take that out, oops. Da -da -da. Uh, ba -ba. Oh no, did that wrong, didn't I? So we'll take out the top note in this instance. We take out the bottom note in that instance. We basically form in the chord. And obviously there is a terrific amount of work still left to do. But compared to video number two, when we were just faced with a huge amount of rests, um, this is a much smoother way of doing it. So prepare the file in the way that I've suggested. Um, um, once it's exported and brought into your notation software, then try and get your new file. Work vertically. It's much easier to work vertically there to there than to be scrolling constantly or even, as I demonstrated before, trying to move from one monitor to, to another. So then, if I want to carry on with this project, as you can see, I still have a fair amount of work to do. But if you employ these techniques before you export that MIDI file and then work methodically copying and pasting vertically into your new notation file, rather than trying to correct the one that's been imported directly, creating parts suddenly is a great deal less hassle. I hope this has been of some use. See you next time.